Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. So today we're going to take a little bit of a break from the political side and get a little bit into the culture of the Cold War and, you know, going from 1945 to 1989 90. Uh, we have some really interesting things that happen culturally. Um, some are kind of humorous and some, I mean, are, are, are interesting and then some will be revolutionary and the achievements of, of what these nations can do. But nonetheless, you know, the people of the world were divided by this as well. And so how did we end up seeing that? Well, one was the Olympics became very, very different. Now, look, don't get me wrong. There are tons of athletes of different countries that achieve incredible amounts of success at the Olympics that have nothing to do with the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Okay, totally need to understand that. That being said, during the Cold War, the Olympics were a way for the U.S. and the USSR to kind of go against each other. And any time you had direct conflict, um, not conflict, if you will, but direct competition in a specific event or sport, it just was really big. I mean, you have the famous U.S. Miracle hockey team in 1980. You have the infamous Soviet basketball team in 1972. Um, you have the two nations who boycotted each other. You know, the U.S. boycotting the Moscow Summer Olympics and then the Russians and then their p friends boycotting the 1984 um, Olympics in Los Angeles. Uh, it got to the point where when you had sports that were judged, you had to make sure that you had like an even amount of like people that were in the middle and then pro-Soviet and pro-U.S. groups so that people got a fair shake, okay, in the judging sports. So it was really interesting to see kind of the impact of that. And as, as a young person growing up, I remember that. I remember, the, you know, the 1984 games and 88 when everybody came back together, but still that tension was there. And, and it was really, really uh, a, a big deal that impacted the Olympics, you know, from the 40s all the way until the 1990s. Then you also have film, and both sides definitely took film and stuff like that as a way that you could propagandize a little bit. Um, and a great example were like the, the spy films and always depicting Russians as bad guys or guys that were trying to bring down the country. Uh, and, and that's what the early films, you see there's Sean Connery, the, not quite the original, um, but James Bond made those movies famous and often fighting Russians and he was, you know, suave and handsome and always got it done. And the other side would often like bungle something and, and, um, that would continue in the 1980s. You had two films, Red Dawn, which is a picture on the bottom right with, you know, a lot of famous actors in it, but, you know, Swayze, who's awesome, um, in which the Russians invade the U.S. and then these kids from this, like, I think Colorado town or fight them off for months and stuff like that. Like, it was crazy. And, of course, the famous Rocky IV, which was, like, one of your most, one of the most blatant, USA versus USSR type things. I mean, in the end, it had this kind of little bit of this goal of like unity and we should come together and use sport to like rise above it all. But it definitely still depicted the United States of America in a, in a little bit of a positive light. But this went on through tons and tons of, of movies and, uh, and TV shows and books and all that type of stuff. And then the Russians had the same thing. I mean, they had a central United Film Studios and a committee on cinema affairs and their job was to basically create the same type of films that were going on in the United States to keep that propaganda. Um, and then you had a famous book written by Ivan Efremov, which, um, excuse me, so what Ivan was trying to do in his book was to show how like communism could result in greatness. So he wrote a book called Andromeda and in that book basically it shows like this pinnacle of society and how if through cooperation and basically through communism, you know, it was also a little bit of sci-fi which was kind of cool, but it showed that it could ultimately be successful. And so both sides are doing this and it's just this is constant competition and going and going. And the ultimate aspect of that competition was undoubtedly in the space race 
because here's where something resulted in like really cool stuff. The achievements that we have in space in many cases are as a direct result between the United States and the USSR trying to constantly outdo themselves. And like basically the fact that we have like GPS today was, was something that the space race brings us. And the Russians were definitely like out in front for a lot of the space race. Um, so you see this picture up top here. That is Sputnik. So they launched the first satellite into space, which, by the way, had incredible impact on the United States because if you notice throughout your schooling, there's always a lot of like your standardized testings are in science and math and you we push a lot of stuff for science and development. That happened because when the Russians put Sputnik in the spa into space, we went bonkers. We we're like, what just happened? The best the United States had was like a rocket that went up like 300 feet and exploded. I mean, NASA gets created as a result of this. We start pushing all these things in space directly because of Sputnik. Now, all it did was go up and beep. I mean, still pretty impressive, but it really drove what we needed to do. But they weren't done. They send the first animal up into space. You see there, Laika the dog. Tragically, she did not return, but first animal up into space. And then they actually send the first artificial probe to reach the moon and that on the right there is luna 2 which actually crashed into the moon and so the russians were able to get something out that way never got a guy but still pretty impressive um and then of course let's go the first uh yuri gagarin in the top left uh would tragically die actually in an air accident uh a few years after this but he is the first man in space, and no one can ever take that away from him. And you have to understand the risk. I mean, we've had the United States has a number of astronauts that have died. The Russians have had cosmonauts that have died. This is not like we we live in a world today where we're like, oh, yes, they, they sent something up to space, no big deal. Like, if anything goes wrong, it's a really big deal. And the fact that he is the first man up in space is absolutely incredible. They follow that, so they follow that, so that was in April 1961. In 1963, they, spend, they send the first woman up in space, Valentina Tereshkova, in 1963 in Vostok 6, so that's a picture of her on the bottom left there. And then on the bottom right, we've got the first ever spacewalk done by a human, and that was Alexei uh, Leonov in 1964. That's a picture of him on the bottom right, and then him out in or you know in the spacewalk as well so the russians were no joke but it pushed the u.s to keep going and trying to get better and so on the u.s side you know we send our first satellite up which is explorer one in 1958 we also send the world's first spy satellite up i don't have pictures of that because you know spy satellite we also send up the first primates uh able over here on the left and Baker over here on the right, I believe Abel is a rhesus monkey, and um, Baker is a squirrel monkey. But what was impressive about them, they're the first primates to go up in the space, but they survived, and we brought them down safely. So, score. Um, and then we have Explorer 6, which is up here on the right, which is actually the first satellite to ever take pictures of the Earth. And we keep going on. We then have Alan Shepard, who's there on the left, as our first man in space. We then send out um, Mariner 2, which was the first satellite to fly by a planet. So the first, you know, that's how far we're going out. Mariner 2 was able to fly by, the, um, by Venus. And then on the right there, of course, we have the famed astronauts of Apollo 11, um, Neil Armstrong on the left, Michael Collins in the middle, and then Buzz Aldrin on the right. I always feel bad for Michael Collins because he was up there and he stayed in the orbiter to make sure that these guys could get back, but then they never sent him back and he never got to walk on the moon. 12 people have walked on the moon. Unfortunately, Michael Collins was never one on them. And I can't under, like, I mean, we put a man on not Earth. Like, I don't care where it's at. It's not Earth. And it's one of the most astounding achievements of humankind ever. 
and should still be celebrated today. Then also, in 2012, Voyager 1 became the first artificial probe to be sent out of the solar system. So Voyager 1 is now in interstellar space. It is not orbiting the sun. That thing is gone. What's crazy, it was launched in like 1970, uh, 1977, and it took to 2012 to get out there. So, because, you know, space is big. But just incredible achievements. So this is in a case in which, like, rivalry has led to awesomeness. And, of course, we have our two famous pictures. On the left, there's Buzz Aldrin. And then on the right, and I believe the picture on the right was taken by Apollo 10. I could be wrong, but I believe that was Apollo 10, the famous Earth Rising picture, and just absolutely incredible. All right, guys, so that's some cultural things and stuff that was going on as a result of the Cold War. Not all of them, but just to give you a little bit of a taste of what that rivalry resulted in. Some kind of funny, some unfortunate, and then some, like, really, really awesome. All right, guys, thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon.